Good evening, everybody. Nate Eaton coming to you live from Boise, Idaho. There we are. It's been a busy afternoon. Uh, a lot going on. A lot happening today in court in the Lori Vallow Daybell murder case. Her son took the stand. Imagine your mother is charged with murdering your younger siblings, your brother and your sister, and you have to go into court and testify against her against her. There was tension in the room. You could feel it, especially at one moment when all of the attorneys went to meet with the judge behind closed doors. So Lori was by herself at the table and Colby was on the stand and he would not look at her and Lori just stared at him. It, it was uh, quite a day. And then we heard for the first time ever publicly a phone call Colby made to his mom as she sat behind bars after JJ and Tylee were found. The call is gut-wrenching. It's about 12 minutes long, and I have it. We'll play it for you. We I got it about an hour ago. That's uh, what, what I've been working on processing. So I'm going to play that in just a few minutes for you. Quality is not the best. Uh, the, the original call quality sounds like it was not the best, and then they played it through the court system today. So it's not not 100% perfect, but you can you can feel the frustration in Colby's voice. And we heard today from Zulema. She was back on the stand. I don't know why we have a black screen there, but let me hit this. Uh, Zulema was back on the stand today, and she... Um, Finished up her testimony. She was cross-examined by John Thomas, the attorney, uh, of course, the, from the defense side, from Lori's side. We also heard from a couple of investigators, a uh, special agent who works for the um, Social Security Administration. He talked about money that, that uh, was coming and going and what you're supposed to do if one of your kids dies and you're getting Social Security money. And he said Lori didn't do what she was supposed to do. We heard from a Rexburg detective, Chuck Consitus. The afternoon got quite... Uh, uh, technical, I guess you could say, multiple exhibits, dozens of exhibits were admitted. And, and when I say exhibits, it's basically a document. You know, you could have a, a bill, like this is one exhibit, we're going to admit it, and then you go through it. So it was a lot of bank statements, a lot of money issues uh, going back and forth. And um, that's what we saw this afternoon as things were happening. So um, we're going to talk about all of that tonight here on courtroom insider before we get going i do want to let i want you to tell me where you are watching from and let me know if you have any questions because we're gathering your questions throughout the evening and we're going to talk about them here uh, as best we can and answer as many questions as we can uh, as we get going here um, tonight so the first thing we want to talk about i keep getting a black screen here is the testimony of zulema so zulema said that um she was questioned for most of the day on Friday, and the uh, testimony was interesting. She talked about the religious beliefs. She talked about a lot about the castings, how they would get together at her house and do these castings, and the you know Lori was involved, and she would assign everybody a an assignment to do these castings, and um, that's what she did. That's what they did as a group there. And John Thomas uh, began cross-examination on Friday afternoon, and then he picked it up first thing this morning. I'm just going to go through a couple of bullet points. I'm in the process of uh, posting her audio that you can listen to, the responses to the questions. She said that her and, Char or her and Alex Cox, so remember, Zulema married Alex Cox, Lori's brother, and then died two weeks later at the end of 2019. They got married in Vegas over the weekend. Same weekend that Melanie Palowski married her new husband, Ian. So Zulema said that uh, they started dating, her and Alex started dating in August of 2019. They kissed and held hands for the first time on Halloween. He proposed to um, Zulema, began ring shopping, and then actually proposed on November the 7th. So I'm just looking at my notes here to be sure I have this exactly right. Yes, yeah, so he proposed to them, on, or he proposed to Zulema on November 7th. Now, here's the interesting thing. John Thomas asked um, Zulema, when did you get married? And she said she didn't remember the day. And he said, you didn't remember the day you got married? He was really trying to pin her down on these details. And she said she didn't remember 
because she didn't remember uh, the day because there was a lot of trauma associated with that time in her life. And she's not wrong. There was a lot of trauma. Uh, you know, her husband, she said, it, of course it was traumatic. I came home from work and my husband was dead on the floor. I left him the morning of December 12th and said goodbye. And I came home and he was dead on the floor. So yeah, there was a bunch of trauma. And my friends were turning against me, or I don't know what my friends were doing. And she explained that. So, an interesting note, though. She, she did not, said she did not recall when she married Alex. And, and, you know, a defense attorney's job is to try to poke holes in the testimony of the prosecutor's witnesses. And so far, we have only heard from the prosecution's witnesses. So that jo John Thomas is doing his job. He's trying to, you know, poke holes in her testimony and say she's not a reliable witness. You can't really believe what she says. Uh, because of she can't remember the day she got married. So we go on to uh, have te text messages between Chad and Zulema. And uh, one such text happened on a, on a day when um, Zulema needed a blessing from Chad because she said her shoulder hurt or her elbow hurt or something like that. Here we go. Uh, this, is the, this is the image of Zulema from today, by the way her on the stand. She did cry. In fact, there were a lot of moments of, of, a uh, of, uh, sadness for Zulema, uh, a lot of tears and tissues, but she, she told, uh, John that yes, there, she called Chad or she texted Chad. She needed a blessing because her shoulder hurt and Chad responded. I've, I've taken away the pain. I've cleared the energy. I don't remember the exact words, but he basically said that she was healed and she responded, Oh, I feel so much better. I can move my shoulder now. So John Thomas is trying to get to the point with her to say, did you, did you believe this from a higher source or did you believe this because Chad and Lori taught you this? And she said, well, now I know that Chad and Lori taught me wrong. She's talked about how Alex totally believed all of this. She said it multiple times that Alex was all in. He totally believed anything Chad and Lori said and would do whatever he said. Um, here was an interesting thing that I thought. The day Charles Vallow died, Zulema was in the temple. She said she was trying to get Hiplos out of Charles's body as he was dying at the house. She said that Lori was supposed to join her that morning at the temple, but she never showed up. And Zulema spent hours there at the temple. Now, here's another interesting point from Zulema that I want to play. That this is how the testimony ended. This is how her testimony ended with John Thomas when he talks about a really powerful spiritual vision that Zulema said she had. And you can listen to, pick up, not necessarily on what she says, although it's interesting. Imagine that you're in the jury seat. Now, all of you watching, by the way, probably know about this case or you've known, or if you don't, welcome. <laughs> you're probably wondering what in the world we're talking about. But imagine that you're in the jury and you're in this seat and you've heard all of this stuff. And then this is talked about from one of the, the key witnesses. I'll play this for you grand jury exhibit uh, but was there a time that you had a, an experience uh, in the in the temple where you went to the phoenix temple in the celestial room and some heavenly beings showed up do you recall that Uh, yes, I do. This is something you won't won't soon forget, right? I mean, it's pretty spiritual. Yes. Pretty powerful. Yes. You said the Heavenly Father was there? Yes, I believe so. And Heavenly Mother was there? I believe so. And Jesus was there? Yes. And your eternal husband was there? Uh, yes. And who was that? Um... I can see who was. Do you recall what happened on that day? No, sir. 
you remember that you saw Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, Jesus in the temple, but you don't know what happened? I'll we'll draw the question, Judge. No further questions. All right. Okay, so did you catch that? There was that long silence. And the minute she started to answer, John Thomas said, I withdraw the question. I withdraw the question. No further questioning. It was memorable. And the jurors might be wondering if she had such this powerful, powerful, powerful spiritual experience yet she can't remember. Now, maybe she just doesn't want to share it. Maybe she's uncomfortable sharing it. That, that could be it. Or maybe she doesn't recall. Or maybe, I don't know what the reason would be. But, you know, John Thomas was trying to put as much doubt as he could in the minds of the jurors that this witness can't be trusted. And she, said, she had said a lot. Uh, we posted all of her part one from Friday on the EastIdahoNews.com YouTube page. If you go subscribe to that YouTube channel hit the little button or the little bell. Every time we post a video, you get a ding so that you know the audio is there if you're interested in that. So Zulema's testimony ends. By the way, someone just asked as I was uh, playing, do the def do the, does the defense get to call their own witnesses? Yes, they will. Al although uh, Jim Archibald has said they have very few, if any. But they can call whoever they want. And as far as the witness list for everybody... Uh, that has not been released. Somebody asked about Lori's mom. Lori's mom is not in town. She hasn't been in town. I have that on very good authority. She has not been here for several. She hasn't been here. So she might be coming later, but she's she's not been here. All right. So after, but, but who is here is Colby. Colby's been here since late last week. They had him ready to go uh, Thursday or Friday, but because testimony went longer on some other ones, he hung out here all weekend. Um, from what I understand, he came by himself. And he took the stand and he walked in the courtroom, didn't look at his mother in the beginning. Another reporter reported that when he walked in, she, Lori, mouthed the words, my baby. Like, oh, my baby's here. I personally did not see that. I'm reporting what another reporter said. My, my seat the past few days has been right behind Lori and the defense on the far end by the window of the third row they moved me back a row today i think i was typing too loud well me and some other reporters so anyway i see Lori and everything but i i can't see the front of her face until she turns which she often does so this other reporter said when colby walked in he she she said my baby the body language said a lot i mean he he looked pretty uncomfortable to be sitting up there a lot of yes no answers um a lot of um not looking at his mom. He occasionally did. I know during a recess when, when everybody stood up to stretch their legs, he looked over at her kind of like this and then turned and not shook his head like that. Like he was disgusted with her. Um, there was one part where Lori teared up and, and cried. And it was when Jim Archibald on cross-examination well, let me get to that first. So let me back up. I'm sorry. Rob Wood questioned Colby about money from Tylee's account and Lori's account. Apparently, Tylee would send Colby money a lot and Lori would too. And sometimes Lori would send it to Tylee to send to Colby and talked about how Colby did not know that there, his siblings were missing until the Gilbert police showed up at his house and said, where are your siblings? And he said, I don't know. Then he couldn't get a hold of his mom. He tried to reach her and the phone had been disconnected. And he talked about, um, you know, the frustration that he had with that. And then on cross-examination, Jim Archibald got up and said, did, you know, did, did your mom take care of you? Did your mom teach you about Jesus? Yes. 
Did your mom sing about Jesus? Yes, at church. Did your mom care for Tylee and JJ? Yes. Did your mom ever talk to you about multiple probations, multiple lives? No. Did your mom ever talk about portals? No. And then the one question that Lori teared up at, did your mom love you? And Colby said, I don't know. Man, that's got to hurt any mom. And did your mom love JJ and Tylee? Just before I came on, I posted all of Colby's testimony. You can go listen to it. And I'm going to play the call in just a minute. The call being the call he made to his mother after JJ and Tylee's bodies were found buried on Chad Daybell's property. She was in the Madison County Jail. He called. He confronted her. And uh, that's the last time they spoke until today. They didn't really speak to each other. But let me show you the pictures of, of Colby, the sketches from today. There's one. He uh, looked real, real trim and fit. Uh, had longer hair, kind of in a little bun at the back of his head. Here's another one of him crying, uh, sniff, sniffing, sniffling, I guess. Here's a sketch of a special agent from the Social Security Administration. His testimony was relatively short, given what we've heard thus far. Maybe he was on there 10, 15 minutes. He works for the Social Security Administration. His name is Mark Sari. He said that he was contacted in January of 2020 about missing kids. Tylee, he said, was getting $1,859 a month. She was getting that because her father, Joe Ryan, died. JJ was getting $1,951 a month because Charles died. Lori was getting $1,951 a month because Charles died. And she was eligible for that because she was married to him when he died. But if she got remarried, she lost that money. So she was total between the three of them getting around six grand a month. And I think that that's tax free. I, that might just be, I believe I've heard that. Somebody in the comments, tell me if, you, if, if, if uh, I'm right or wrong. I believe that when you get that money, it's tax free. It's already been taxed. You don't pay taxes on government money. So six thousand grand, six grand a month, not bad, tax free. Well, um, Rob would ask this this detective to go through, uh, or this special agent to go through their qualifications when you're on Social Security. What you have to do if, say, the person getting Social Security dies, you have to notify the Social Security Administration. They disappear. You probably need to notify them. You get married. You need to notify them. And Rob Wood ended his testimony by saying, did Lori Vallow message you or contact you after her son disappeared? No. After Tylee disappeared? No. After she got married? No. She continued to get the money until they shut it off in January of 2020. They showed the documents that Lori Vallow had received in the mail saying, you must notify us if these things happen. So he took the stand, and then after him, we had Chuck Consitis. Chuck is a big cop. He's with the uh, Rexburg Police Department. He, uh, oh, there we go. That's, there, there's the sketch of him. He is the detective who, uh, he's been a detective for quite some years. And his was a lot of documents. In fact, before he even took the stand, there was a massive envelope slash folder type thing that they set up there that was just chock full of documents. And there was all sorts of exhibits. And Detective Consitis testified that um, when he went to the house, when the children were, when JJ was first reported missing, he went to the Rexburg house with a search warrant. He was helping the detectives with their search warrant. They went up into a room and he found a bedroom or he found a printer. And on the printer was an invoice for Self Storage Plus, which is where all of those items were found that Lori left behind. They also got a search warrant for a post office box that Lori had set up in Sugar City, Idaho, which is right outside of Rexburg. And when police went to that uh, post office box, there was, he said, hundreds and hundreds of letters. There was bills and there was invoices and there was all sorts of stuff. And they went through those and they found that, um, and then they got search warrants for all of Lori's bank accounts. And she had a lot. There was a lot of shared accounts and credit card accounts and all sorts of money being moved around. And basically each document they had to admit 
as evidence or for uh, exhibit purposes, basically for the jury to see what was happening. And, and the interesting takeaway from all this, again, it got technical and it lasted about two hours. I'll post that audio if you really want to listen to it. It is, it is kind of interesting to see. Don't ever think that one little transaction at a gas station can't be tracked with your credit card because it can. And they tracked Ch uh, Tylee's activities. Majority of her purchases up until August of 2019, the month before she disappeared, the majority of her transactions with her bank card were brick and mortar stores, fast food restaurants, convenience stores, places she actually went in and swiped the card. But then in September of 2019, of course, the month she disappears, everything switches to online. Except there's two charges, one at Costa Vida in Rexburg on September 8th, likely the last time Tylee was alive, and one at the Costa Vida in Idaho Falls. Whoever used her card after she had died, either Alex or Lori, went to Costa Vida twice. Um, and, and Tylee had her bank account that she would get her Social Security money in. And then a few months before she died, Lori switched it for that money to go into a joint account that she and Tylee had. Which, looking back now, was, was Lori planning something? The fact that this money was being shifted. And that one account that Tylee had, the balance just dwindled down until it got down to $10.04. And Lori transferred the money to her account and the other account was closed. Interesting. Two purchases, as I said, were made after Tylee died at the uh, Costa Vida restaurants. Alex, Alex's bank account was also interesting, too. They pulled his data. Alex had a steady job that paid pretty well. I believe it was 4000 a paycheck twice a month, two or three times a month. And, and the detective was able to show that that money went in regularly. And Alex was, uh, that money stayed in there and he made transactions. You know, he spent money like all of us do. But then he quit his job in, in August of 2019 right before he was going to move to Rexburg because again, Chad and Lori had told him you need to move to Rexburg. So he quits his job, the regular deposits stop, and then he takes out a $21,000 loan. And with that $21,000, or at least part of it, he bought 46 guns between August 10th and October 24th, according to the detective. That's a lot of guns and ammunition. And a lot of those guns were found there in Lori's garage. So you think about it. He he's, gets the 21 grand, buys the 26 gun, 46 guns, and then he dies a few months later. Um, we didn't make it through De Detective Concitus's testimony today he's back on the stand tomorrow with more exhibits it kind of ended with that the there was so much paperwork that there was some misnumbering or some confusion about the number on the exhibits and uh they're going to get that straightened out and, and he'll be back on the stand tomorrow so really a full day we we went through four witnesses zulema colby a jail call we went through the detective from the rexburg police we went through the social security agent talking about the finance financial side of things. And I imagine that will continue tomorrow. You know, as Colby went up to the stand, it, it was just heartbreaking to see this young man who uh, his mom is there, you know, charged with murder. And um, there are some pictures of the two of them, obviously in much happier times. And with that, I want to play you the, the call. So this call was made after JJ and Tylee were found. And um, I have to say, the quality is not the best. The quality on the original call was not the best because it was through a jail connection. So there's some clicks and some noises. And then what you're hearing is them playing it through the court system today. And you hear some other clicks, but you should be able to hear it if you listen close. Give me your thoughts as you're watching this in the comments. I want to know honestly what you're thinking as I play this call. It's about 12 minutes long. I'll play it for you now, and we'll talk about it uh, on the other side.
know what actually happened. You're right, and you know what? And we all will stand there with everything.
Heavenly Father himself and ask him to help me survive this. Do you understand the uh, freaking earthquake that has been caused? Do you know how many people are hurt and broken now? And you're telling me that there's a reason? Why are you following Chad down the rabbit hole, Mom? Why would you follow anybody that is not good? How can you follow someone that cannot lead you to salvation in Jesus, Mom? You can't lie to me anymore. You can't pretend anymore. You can't hide anymore. If you want to tell me what happened, I called you for that very reason. You had enough condemnation for the whole time and eternity, but you're telling me that you're going to stand in front of Jesus Christ and you're going to be fine. That I'm still praying for you. I am still praying for you. I don't know where the lies and all these things are written. I don't see it. I never have. The life of Jesus Christ is the most powerful thing that's ever lived. It's the most loving, embracing thing that has ever happened to this world. And I pray that you see him and fall into his grace. I pray every day. I pray no matter how mad I am at you, no matter how bad I want to hit your husband in the face with a shovel. I pray for you. I pray for him. You ripped my heart out and you ripped out everyone in this family's heart out. I'm going to be in Idaho next, this week. You need to look me in my eye, Mom. Look me in my eye. And that's the end of the call. Whether Lori hung up or whether it was disconnected, that's the end of the call. Many of you are asking, who was that sniffling? That was Colby. He was on the stand as they played that call in the courtroom. The typing you're hearing is from the court reporter or uh, somebody up there uh, with the prosecution, perhaps. That was the call. A couple of key points from it I mean, there's really not much to say if you couldn't hear it it's hard to hear go back and listen put in earbuds or turn it up really loud when when we're done tonight and listen to it um the part that really got me and it appears a lot of you is when he accuses her of blasphemy and she laughs she kind of has a, a cackle a, a laugh and he says, you're laughing at this, mom? How come your camera isn't on? Apparently, this was a video chat. She could see him, but she didn't turn on her camera. She says, I love you. I always will. One day you will understand. Tylee and JJ love me, and they know the truth. You can judge me all day long. The whole world has. And Colby obviously does not hold back. He says, I've been praying for you and I've been praying for your husband as much as I want to hit him in the face with a shovel. It's quite a call. And I have to tell you, there's at least one more call coming, not from Colby, but from somebody else. And it is just as gut wrenching, if not more. And, uh, from it, it will be coming during the trial and it is just something. So that is what happened today in court. Um, I want to get to your questions, but before we do that, I want to show you this beautiful picture of um, Tylee. One of you all sent me this great message about Tylee. Um, this was her on the beach. Tylee's favorite color was a bright blue. She called it the color of Hawaii. This was a picture she took and posted on her Instagram, and she captioned it, happiness comes in waves. Tylee was a great photographer. She took this picture of JJ. Oh, shoot. Can you not see it? Darn it. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry. My computer here is uh, messing up. I think that you saw the other one of Tylee. Um... <laughs> Darn it. Here's what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to hold this picture up for you to see on my um, screen, on the camera. There's a picture of Tylee. And this is uh, another picture. Uh, it's a great photo of um, JJ. Let me show it to you. I'm, I, I don't know why my uh, thing keeps shorting out. But Tylee was a great photographer. Oh, crap. I'm sorry. Um, I might have to show you this tomorrow night. No, here we go. Can you see that picture of JJ? Yeah, not really. She, uh, there you go. She took that in the sand of him playing. And, and then this is, this is another one that I love. This is JJ playing in the water. Oh, there you go. Good. It's a beautiful picture. I mean, that, that could be like the cover of a book or something. That's him playing in the water with the sun setting behind him. And Tylee took that with her camera. Here's the one of Hawaii that she said she loved. Maybe we can get a focus on that. There we go. And the person that sent me these said, um, uh, Tylee was very artistic. She was great at drawing, decorating, coloring, doing makeup, but her photography really stood out. She had a great eye from a young age. She took so many beautiful pictures. Some of her best pictures were of her little brother, JJ. She loved him and captured so many precious moments with him. And yeah, those are the great pictures. So, um, man, we, we remember Tylee and we remember JJ and Charles and Tammy um, as we cover this horrible trial and all of those who have been affected by it. All right, I think we're ready for your questions. There's a lot coming in here. So I'm going to pop over here to my window. Please send them in. Um, I, I have to thank Peggy, my colleague, who goes through... The, throughout the day and goes through all the questions and then sends them to me some of the some of the ones and then I see some that I send her and say hey let's talk about this tonight first question what is a day like for Lori in jail well right now she's in court every day so she gets on a bus around 7 to 7 30 ish and they bring her down to the Ada County courthouse on a big white bus that they transport all the inmates in she gets off she is brought out with her attorneys and then um, she sits in court all day and then she goes back around dinner time, five o'clock. Well, four o'clock probably. Um, I know that uh, today what was interesting is for the first time since the trial started, she was not shackled to the ground. So I don't know if her attorney asked for that request to be made or not, but um, that, that was an interesting thing to notice today. As far as the uh, jail every day, uh, when she was in Madison County, we knew what it was like. We, we interviewed the sergeant there, and he said that they have to get up at a certain time every day, and they have to do chores and do assignments, and then they eat, and then they are able to, you know, read or, or do activities or whatnot. Um, and so that, that's what they know that it's like for, for her. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know what it's like at the Ada County Jail, though, to be honest with you. What were Lori's expressions while Zulema talked? Uh, I don't know if she had much of an expression, to be honest with you. She just, she, as I said, my, my, I see the back of her head and unless she turns this way, um, she takes notes. She is actively involved with her attorneys. They are all working on the case together and, um, she really didn't display much. If any, if any, there was any sort of reaction today with anything, it was with Colby, uh, over Zulema. And I'm sure that Lori will will dispute some of the things that um, Zulema said. I can, I can imagine it. And we'll see. We'll see if that happens. Okay, next question. Erica, all of Chad's books are still shelved in the Madison County Library. I've asked them to remove them, but to no avail. Do you think their cult-like following still exists? I don't know. Here's the thing. I would have said a few weeks ago, nah, I think it's done. I have received three emails from people in the past week who have all asked to be anonymous, who have told me their stories about being involved and following some of Chad's teachings or all of Chad's teachings or some variety of it. 
and it just stuns me. I, I, I am surprised. I, I don't think, I mean, I'm sure there's people that have some of the ideas and maybe they pick and choose the doctrines he was teaching, but, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't imagine the books will be shelved there much longer if he's accused of a crime, but I, I don't, I don't know how that works. Interesting question. I, many of you have sent me the books. Thank you for sending those. And there's another book that s several of you have sent me that uh, you believe that that's where Chad got his teachings from. Um, I won't name it, but it, it was very similar to what we've heard in court. Brianna mentioned, you'd mentioned how hard it might be to find a clean jury in Ada County. After Lori's trial, what if we can't find a clean jury at all? Where could they go to hold court for Chad? Great question. In fact, I was just talking about this today with a few people. Um, after this trial, the Boise media has been covering it heavily, along with the national media. But most of the jurors say that they hear about it from the local media. So I don't know if the judge would move it to like Twin Falls or Coeur d'Alene or something, or it would just have to try really hard to get another jury that hasn't heard about it. Um, I don't know. That, that, that is a great question. And that's a challenge the court has to have. The, the question is, you, you can you can have... you. You can have heard about the case. You can say, I've heard about the case. And so a lot of these jurors did. They said, yeah, I heard about it. A couple in Hawaii, dead kids. But that's all I know. I didn't see the Netflix. I didn't see Dateline. I don't watch Nate Eaton. You know, stuff like that. Then they'll say, okay, you can hear about it. But it's if you're like, yeah, I binge watched the show 12 times. And here's my theories. You're out. Why was Colby receiving money from Lori or, in fact, Tylee? Well, I think that that was just kind of a family arrangement. Um, it wasn't like Social Security benefits or anything. I just think that Lori would send him money, and sometimes he'd ask Tylee for money is what it sounded like, and they used Venmo and Cash App, and, and they would send it through. Was Colby in court alone? He was. Was anyone with him for support? No. Was Colby still married? He said he, he did tell the defense attorney that he is still married. Why do you think there were so many guns, Diane asks? It was an arsenal. Well, they thought, apparently, that the end of the world was coming. So maybe that was one way. Uh, they thought the zombies were coming. Maybe that was another way. Stockpile these weapons and ammunition. I don't know. It's a lot of guns. Renee, so far, which witness has been the most detrimental testimony against Lori? Oh, boy. Good. Y'all have good questions. Keep sending them. Um, I don't know if there's one. I think they all have been powerful in their own way. And it's been all compressed into... Now, six days of testimony just jam-packed. You know, Kay was the very first one. Kay Woodcock, she was powerful. The detective may not have caused any tears or anything today, but he was showing the money, where the money was going and coming. In fact, the detective did get choked up for a moment. When they were talking about the money, he talked about when the money started to leave and, and when it went into the account. And then he said on the on June 9th, the day the kids died. And got, he got choked up at that moment. Was Lori really cry, crying today? I, so again, I couldn't see. I saw her grab tissues. I saw her wiping her eyes. I texted Chanley on the other side of the courtroom, Chanley with Court TV. And I said, are you seeing her crying? We were texting back and forth, communicating back and forth um, on our computers, not on our phones. And, uh, Chanley said that she saw tears and wiping. So I, I, I think she was. A couple days ago, Lori had the opportunity to hear Chad's voice in court. What was her reaction? I didn't see one. Just normal. I didn't see any sort of reaction, excitement, sadness, nothing. How'd you end up in little old Idaho? You should be in New York or LA. Come on. <laughs> um, well, if I was in New York or LA, I couldn't be covering this. I, my dream one day was to be in New York or LA or a big city. And I, I've had some interests and opportunities lately uh, to go to maybe New York or maybe LA, but I'm very happy where I am. And uh, I'm happy with East Idaho News. So thank you. I, I, and one day, maybe I'll talk about my journey, how I ended back here, because I worked in television in Idaho. And I remember the day I left, I said, I will never be back. My, my little Honda Civic got stuck in the snow two or three times because of it was a blizzard, and I'm like, I'm out of here. I will never move back to Idaho. And as defiant that I was about moving to Idaho, my wife was so much more. <laughs> Maybe we can have her on again, and we can tell the story. 
Please care, Bree, please clarify who did cross exam today, Archibald or Thomas. Good question. The, the first, uh, John Thomas did cross examination for Zulema, and then Jim Archibald did it for the others. He did it for Colby. There was no cross examination on the um, secret or the social security guy. And Chuck Consitus is still on the stand, and there has not been any cross for him yet. So both. Who pays for the witness travel and hotels? The state does. If there are witnesses for the state, they pay for that. If there are witnesses for the defense, the defense pays for that. Any idea how big the three rocks were on JJ's burial area? Michelle asks. I believe they were around this big based on the photo. I can double check tomorrow, but I, I think that they were this big. There was planks. Maybe they were bigger. I mean, I just saw a photo, so I don't have a frame of reference, um, but there were three white rocks on there. Has JJ's biological dad been to court yet? No, he has not. Amanda asked that. What does the role of an alternate juror look like? Because I'd be mad if I got to the end of the trial and didn't get to vote. Yeah, that's a good question. So they don't know who the alternates are. Nobody does. The judge has asked each juror to pay attention and act as if they are the main juror. And then when it comes time to deliberate, whoever's left, assuming they're all there, or if we lose one or two between now and then because of different reasons, the judge, I think, I don't know if he'll randomly like draw a number out of a hat and say, here's the 12 or what, but... Um, the alternates won't get to deliberate, but man, they can say they sat on the jury for this. Um, I think that's the, that's all we'll do with the questions. I, I do want to tell you, uh, I have a special thing coming up tomorrow night. We'll be here for courtroom insider at seven 30. I hope you'll join in after courtroom insider at eight 30. Where is Elantra? So I'm shifting gears here. This is another case. A 16-year-old FLDS member disappeared in January. Her, she took her mom's car. It was later found at a gas station with a note. And the mother has been searching for her daughter for four months now. Just yesterday, a news conference was held in uh, Cedar City, Utah, where Elantra's mother, Elizabeth Roundy, and several other parents of missing kids who, who they believe ran back to the FLDS group, polygamous group, held a news conference, and they want their kids back. So tomorrow night live at 8.30, we're going to have an interview with Elantra's mom. I'm going to be interviewing an attorney who has helped thousands of, of people flee polygamy and polygamous groups along with the founder of a group called, hold on, it's a great group. She, um, it's called Holding Out Help. And basically back in 2008, this woman was dying of cancer, but she beat cancer. She had a terminal cancer. She beat it. And as she beat it, someone came to her and said, can you help this family of six who, who is fleeing polygamy, start a new life. And she says it's, it's like refugees leaving, leave, uh, leaving a foreign country when they flee polygamy. It's like they're brand new. We're going to talk to her. We're going to talk to the attorney. We're going to talk to Al Elantra's mother, Ellie's mom, and, and, and the fear that she has that there is a new polygamous leader of the FLDS. His name is Harrison Jeffs. He's the son of Warren Jeffs, and he does not care about the law. And these people are worried that all of these missing teenage girls are getting married off to old men, older men, and uh, that they might never be seen again, that they're hiding somewhere. So that will be tomorrow night at um, 7, 8.30, 8.30 Idaho time. So come here at 7.30, pop two bags of popcorn. We'll talk about the case at 7.30. The Daybell case, the latest that happens, whatever happens tomorrow, and then right at 8.30, we'll go into where is Elantra, and I, I hope that you'll be uh, interested in that. And if you have questions on that, feel free to submit those, but again, Courtroom Insider continues tomorrow. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you had a good day. I hope that this was helpful, and again, let me know if you have questions. I'm, I'm happy to take them, and I hope you have a good night.